My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. Win the word of God. You know, Hosea said something. If we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. He says that then shall we know. And what are we going to know? He said, if we follow on to know the Lord, so it is possible to know the Lord, but you must follow on. It's not a one-time Bible study. It's not a one-time coming to church. It's not just a five-minute prayer. It says that we will know if we follow on, if we continually. That is why you don't stop coming to church. After you came one head, one scripture, and you keep saying it and say, I know God. He said that if we follow on to know him, we shall know him. And he said that he is going forth, is prepared as a morning. In other words, he's, he must visit. It is a sure banker. God will visit if his people follow on to know him. It is possible to know God right on earth. I've been saying this and I mean it. That one of my biggest disappointments will be when I get to heaven and I'm surprised about everything. That means that for my stay on earth, I never pursued to know God. If I get to heaven and I am so shocked of everything that will be shown me, that means that I never followed on on earth to want to know him. He says that when you pray, pray that your will will be done exactly as it is in heaven that means that there is a possibility to know exactly things that are done in heaven it's possible for a mortal man on earth to know and he said when you follow on you will know the lord if you will follow on if you know it will not be reading one chapter of the bible a, a week he said if you follow on he shall visit you like the latter rain and the former rain. In other words, there will be constant visitation from the Lord if you will follow on. In John chapter 14 verse 21, he says that they that keep my commandment are they that love me. And he said that he that loves me, the Father will love him. And I will make him my abode and I will manifest myself to him. There is a secret to encountering Jesus right on earth. And that secret is following on to know him through his word. He says that if you will keep the word in your heart, if you will discard the knowledge of football, discard the knowledge of telenovelas, discard the knowledge of gossips, discard every knowledge and follow on to want to know Jesus. He said, I will manifest myself if somebody comes to you and tell you that I have been having an unusual encounter with Jesus, don't doubt the word of God has said it. They that fall on to want to know. No wonder Apostle Paul, after writing all the epistles, would come out and say that I may know him. I want to know him. And for three years, Listen, look at how he ushered the church of Ephesus to begin to know Jesus. The Bible said that for three years, day and night, day and night, for three years, he taught them the word. Day and night, for three years. 
to tell somebody to come to church continuously for three years that will be the biggest insult you will ever receive but for three years day and night apostle paul was with the Ephesian church because he understood when he himself had an encounter the bible says that he went to arabia for three years he was there studying studying the word suddenly light flood in his spirit and that was how he became a transgenerational apostle it's possible to have encounters with god and the secret is if you know the word of god if you follow on to know him through his word if you rise up monday morning and all you are looking for is to want to know him and to know him through his word he said it's possible it's possible to have divine encounters it is possible to have visitations it is possible this time when you preach for even one hour people begin to shake be fast and let us go that be fast and let us go spiritually the meaning is that i never want to encounter jesus that's what it means and after three years the bible said that miracles broke out in the church of ephesus and in the city of ephesus to a point that handkerchiefs and aprons were casting out devils why because a people decided that for three years day and night we want to know the word of god this time when you preach for even one hour people begin to shake be fast and let us go that be fast and let us go spiritually the meaning is that i never want to encounter jesus that's what it means So Psalm 119 verse 18. Open thou my eyes that I may behold the wondrous things of the Lord. This was the prayer of a man called David. If I was in his time, I don't think I would have prayed that prayer. When everybody thought that the law was only full of feasts and sacrifices, all they saw was priesthood lineage the waiver offerings the grain offerings that is all they knew and his generation were pursuing the law of moses according to sight they would do ceremonies do feasts make sacrifices oblations do other stuff and that is all they, th they thought the law was about but a prophetic man went on in this and said lord open my eyes there are wondrous things in the law the law is not just about killing animals there are things in it open my eyes and let me see when people think it's just a shadow lord open down my eyes and this is what distinguished the man in his generation the hebrew word for wondrous things there means pala pala means that give me the hidden things of the law that means that the law is not just there there are things that have been hidden from the eyes of the people that read the law and he said show me show me the distinguished things of the law and the man comes out and suddenly he is able to tell, pick words from eternity in Psalm 22 and begin to tell, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? These words were prepared and hidden and to be released in the mouth of Jesus on the cross. But a man who prayed the prayer that, Lord, let me see, that man was able to have access to hidden words in his generation. 
and he was able to tell how Jesus do you know even the gospels were not able to tell the pain of Jesus there were people watching them but they couldn't tell and narrate how Jesus went through the pain but a man thousands of years to that time who prayed that God opened my eyes could tell that even the bones of Jesus could be counted and his flesh would go off and he said no bone was broken why open down my eyes there are wondrous things beyond these letters are wondrous things you may read it as a story but beyond it beyond the gospels beyond the epistles are some wondrous things of the spirit and it takes prophetic men to understand that I'm not just to read to quote it why do the hidden range and the people imagine a vain thing they said let us cut asunder from the Lord and his anointed and he said the Lord seated in heaven and he laughs and Peter appears in the book of Acts 2 and he said this thing David said he spoke of you that how you will arrest Jesus and crucify him how did David know these things by chapter 22 of Psalms he talked about how Jesus would die and the details of his death by chapter 23 of the book of Psalms the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want he was this big thing how Jesus would die he would die but he will resurrect again he was talking about he prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies and the man was talking about John chapter 13 how a table will be there and he said the cup ran over and on that table was a bread and a communion wine and on that same table was Judas whom the enemy has entered he prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies hey open down my eyes that I may behold the wondrous things of your word. I want to know there is something more to John 3.16. There is something more. Open down my eyes. If I see it, I will never be the same again. There is something more in the book of Ephesians. If I see it, I will not live this mediocre life I'm living. There is something more in the epistles and in the gospel. Beyond these letters are secrets to prosperity. Open down my eyes. Beyond these letters are secrets to living the fullness of the glorious life of God on earth. For we are partakers of his divine nature. Beyond this is how a man can walk upon the surface of the earth and transition into glory and yet for 200 years his name will still be mentioned a man like john wesley open down my eyes let me see what others are joking with let me see what others are playing with this bible others have closed up and only pick it when they are coming to church let me see the wondrous things these are the secrets of life this is the secret of peace this is the secret of glory if a man can stay in this even one hour every day this is where wonderful things are created when a man can pick words from the mouth of God and live his life with those words even to a time that those words become his counsel that such a man will not sit and say that I don't care what the Bible says this is how I feel but that man will say in the presence of the word of God I relegate my emotions I relegate what I studied in school I relegate the wisdom of this world and I pick up these counsels of the Lord he said when you see it you will know that there are wonderful things by chapter 24 of the book of Psalms the man was talking about his resurrection and his ascension who shall ascend the holy hills of the Lord except a man with a pure heart and a man with a clean hands and he said he also spoke of his resurrection and said that O oh, ye gates open up lift up your hairs O oh, ye gates for the king of glory is coming who is the king of glory the man of war mighty in battle he said lift up your hands on the third day the tomb cannot keep him lift up your hands 
This is a man who prayed and said, Lord, if you will open my eyes to the wondrous things beyond the sacrifices and some deep things, I want to know it. I want to know it. He was the same man when everybody was seeing priesthood in the lineage of Aaron. He began to stay. For he will come in the order of Melchizedek. For this day, has the Lord begotten thee. Who is this man? He was seeing beyond any mouse. He was seeing beyond the garments of the priest. In this generation, those that will make a distinct impact are those who go beyond the letters. There is a possibility to know Jesus. There is open down my eyes. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus began to speak and he tells them, what did you go ye to see? And he said, you go, you went to see. Even the reed being shaken of the wind. He said, what did you go to the wilderness unto John the Baptist to see? And he said, you went, did you go to see a man in soft raiment? He said, those who dress gramously are they that rest in the court of the kings. And he said, did you go to see a prophet? He said, no, this one is more than a prophet. And he said, among all that are born of women, there is none greater than John the Baptist. But he said, and in the kingdom of God, he is the least. And then the Bible said, and those, even the, 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 the task collectors and the sinners and the, and the publicans that were there, the Bible said, and they justified God that they have been baptized of the baptism of John. But the Bible said, but for the Pharisees and the scribes, the word of God says, for they rejected the counsel of God for not being baptized of John. Hear this. It was after Jesus has appeared and all of them were convinced that this man carries a spirit. And then the man began to tell them that this is who John is. Among all that are born of, the, of women, he is the greatest. And even if he, he is higher than being called a prophet, he is greater than a prophet. He was a voice that Isaiah spoke of. That this is the voice of the world in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. The Bible said, and they that were baptized of him began to justify God and say, Lord, thank you that we went and to be baptized of John. Why? Because now we have seen who he is. Now we have known what the baptism is. But the Bible said, but for the Pharisees and the scribes, they got to understand that they have rejected the counsel of God. That means that the baptism of John could be equated to the counsel of God. They didn't know at that time that John was not just doing his own thing. It was not just enthusiasm. It was the counsel of God to be established on earth to be baptized no wonder the one that is sent from the lord the son of god understood that what john is doing in yes and the eternal it is a counsel of the lord and the bible said everybody was being baptized nothing happened but jesus being baptized and praying he understood that this thing is a spiritual thing everyone is taking it lightly but it's a spiritual thing the bible said and when he was praying the heavens opened Allah taya ilai I have been in the temple, I've not seen this. I have been in my brother's house, I've not seen it, but I understood the mystery. And whilst he prayed, the heavens opened, and the declaration came: This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. This thing people took lightly because they didn't see. Is what opened the heavens over somebody. Could it be that the things we trivialize in our generation is a counsel from God? Could it be that the prophets who are not as rich as John the Baptist was, could it be that the little they are doing is a counsel from the Lord? He said, after the Pharisees knew they have rejected after they have seen that they have rejected the counsel of the Lord he 
because they were not baptized of John. Open thou my eyes that I may see. That this Bible is not just a book. That lifting up my hands is not just for fun. Open thou If their eyes were open like Jesus, they wouldn't have. Listen, Jesus described their attitude of going to the wilderness. He said, some of you went there to see the breeze. And you just covered it up with baptism. He said, some of you heard that he dresses in animal skin. So you went there to check his clothes. He says, some of you heard that he has been preaching like a prophet. So you went there to check whether he's a prophet. But you never went there with an understanding into what baptism is. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus began to speak. And he tells them, what did you go here to see? And he said, you go, you went to see. Even the reed being shaken. Of the wind he said what did you go to the wilderness unto john the baptist to see and he said you went did you go to see a man in soft raiment he said those who dress grammously are they that rest in the court of the kings and he said did you go to see a prophet he said no this one is more than a prophet and he said among all that are born of women there is none greater than john the baptist but he said and in the kingdom of god he is the least and then the bible said and those even the the the, the task collectors and the sinners and the, and the publicans that were there the bible said and they justified god that they have been baptized of the baptism of john but the bible said but for the pharisees and the scribes the word of god says for they rejected the counsel of god for not being baptized of john hear this it was after jesus has appeared and all of them were convinced that this man carries a spirit and then the man began to tell them that this is who john is among all that are born of the of women he is the greatest and even if he he is higher than being called a prophet he is greater than a prophet he was a voice that isaiah spoke of that this is the voice of the will in the wilderness prepare you the way of the lord the bible said and they that were baptized of him began to justify god and say lord thank you that we went and to be baptized of john why because now we have seen who he is now we have known what the baptism is but the bible said but for the pharisees and the scribes they got to understand that they have rejected the counsel of god that means that the baptism of john could be equated to the counsel of god they didn't know at that time that john was not just doing his own thing it was not just enthusiasm it was the counsel of god to be established on earth to be baptized no wonder the one that is sent from the lord the son of god understood that what john is doing in yes and the eternal it is a counsel of the lord and the bible said everybody was being baptized nothing happened but jesus being baptized and praying he understood that this thing is a spiritual thing everyone is taking it lightly but it's a spiritual thing the bible said and when he was praying the heavens opened Allah taya Eli. I have been in the temple. I've not seen this. I have been in my brother's house. I've not seen it. But I understood the mystery. And whilst he prayed, the heavens opened. And the declaration came. This is my beloved son. In whom I am well pleased. This thing people took lightly. Because they didn't see is what opened the heavens over somebody could it be that the things we trivialize in our generation is a counsel from god could it be that the prophets who are not as rich as john the baptist was could it be that the little they are doing is a counsel from the lord he said after the pharisees knew they have rejected Luke 7 29 after they have seen that they have rejected the counsel of the Lord 
because they were not baptized of John. Open thou my eyes that I may see. That this Bible is not just a book. That lifting up my hands is not just for fun. Open thou If their eyes were open like Jesus, they wouldn't have... Listen, Jesus described their attitude of going to the wilderness. He said, some of you went there to see the breeze. And you just covered it up with baptism. He said, some of you heard that he dresses in animal skin. So you went there to check his clothes. He says, some of you heard that he has been preaching like a prophet. So you went there to check whether he's a prophet. But you never went there with an understanding into what baptism is. The Bible said that, and the sinners began to rejoice and justify what it is. Listen, sometimes those who don't know much get to have beautiful and wonderful things for God more than those who feel they know everything. The Bible says, after Jesus has explained everything, Pharisees were there, sinners were there, sinners began to rejoice. Why? Because we didn't understand. All we knew was that we believed in what he did. Now we justify. God has been justified. And that's what we did there. But the Pharisees who are studying and criticize the whole Old Testament were found wanting that they have rejected the counsel of the Lord. If you can see some wonderful things here, you will know. You will know that church is not a joke. You will not be like the Pharisees. No. You will not reject the counsel of God when you will have accepted it and received an unusual divine encounter. I pray for you today that with the eyes of your understanding. after the sacrifice of Christ it was the angels that would one day teach us how we could have fought the devil this time he's not talking about a serpent he's talking about a, an old dragon he said that the old serpent called the devil and Satan who defeated the whole world he said this is a great dragon we are dealing with but this is the same serpent that you know in the garden of Eden 
But now, he has not changed into another creature. He has only grown in everything he does to a point that he is now a dragon, the same nature, but he has grown. And he said, the old serpent deceived just two people. But this dragon has the capacity to deceive the whole world. But the question is, does the whole world know they are in deception? If you call a president of a nation and tell him that the devil is deceiving you, will he agree? And the worst of it is that he comes down to say that he is the one that accused the brethren before the Lord day and night. That means that even inclusive of the world that he deceives is the church. And then he goes before God and he doesn't accuse the unbelievers, he accuses the brethren. He deceives the whole world, including the church. Does the church know we are being deceived? How many of us know that we are walking in deception? But the Bible says that one of the revelations that will happen in the last day is that we will all see the dragon and we will see how he was able to deceive the whole world. And then he will go back to God and accuse. Listen to me. God is so powerful and God is so dangerous that nobody on earth from demons to human beings to animals can stand before him and raise false accusation. That means that every accusation the devil will take to him because of the brethren is a true one. So he would deceive us. And you know his deception in when he was a serpent. What has God said? You are more than what God has told you. You can get more than what God has told you. He said, don't touch this tree. No, if you touch it, you'll be wiser like him. That has been a system. And he will use it to deceive the whole world. And he will use it to deceive the church. As you are seated now, there is an agenda of the devil to deceive you. You think just to kill you? Just to give you sickness? Just, just so that your business don't work. You think the devil is interested in that? His agenda is to twist what God is saying in today's generation. What God is saying, what he has said, the devil's agenda. And now he's a dragon. He has gone beyond two people. He can deceive millions at a time. That is how he can raise one man. And that man will have three million followers on Instagram. And when that man twists anything then three million people are following. When the lady exposes herself and Christians together with pastors, when people go and do pornography, then leaders, Christians, pastors, also have pornography on their phones and they are watching. He is deceiving the whole world. But after that, he goes before the Lord and accuses only the brethren. Do we know that the devil's agenda today is to twist the word? Do everything possible to pull us from the truth. Do you know that? The devil don't want you to believe truly what God has said. Do you know? Do you know that his true agenda is so that you will call yourself a Christian, but every message you hear is not in line with what God wants you to hear? Do you know? The Bible says, for Satan has transformed himself. 2 Corinthians 11. He has transformed himself into an angel of light. So has his ministers also transformed themselves into ministers of righteousness. The devil has apostles. The devil has prophets. The devil has teachers. And the Bible has defined the scope and the framework of their message. They also preach righteousness. The question is that, what righteousness would the devil preach? So that when we follow it, he will have the right to accuse us before God. And he is waiting for the church to accept that message. And to run with that message of his apostles. Then when we walk in that message, then he goes before the Lord. To accuse us. This, I believe, is that righteousness that after he has delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and from sin, Peter said, We run back as a dog runs back to his vomit. And we go back as a swine that has been washed, but they go back into the mud. That is the righteousness that teaches you that you're already righteous. Whatever you do doesn't matter. If it doesn't matter, why did Jesus even come to die? If it doesn't matter, why did he pay that penalty? If you can just declare you are righteous and do anything you want, why didn't he just let us declare? It was a total life 
of redemption. Do you know what redemption is? To be telling me that you, all you do is to declare, but you already redeemed. Do you know what redemption is? Do you know what to be born again is? Do you know what to be a new creator and all things are passed away is? The deception of the dragon happening right in our eyes. The whole world and Jesus said it in Matthew 24, 24. He said, false Christ and false prophets will come. And if the time is not cut, they will deceive even the elect. Have you seen now? You have been preached to, to a point that lies is nothing to you. You have been preached to, to a point that living a wayward life, watching pornography, fornicating, doing all kinds of maligning, lavishness, all these things are nothing to you anymore. Then it's Archangel Michael and his angels that will show us the key. He said, and they overcame him by the word. Why you should know the true word of God. They overcame him by the word of their testimony. And by the blood of the Lamb. Word of testimony. And the verse 17 tells us that they spoke of the testimony of Jesus Christ. That was the only way the dragon can be defeated. That is the only way. When the whole church become witnesses of who Jesus is. That it goes beyond just our speech to everything we are. He said that was the secret of their victory. The word of their testimony. Hadi Kalasabia. When we all have one message, and that message is Jesus. When nothing can change your mind, when no message interests you again, apart from that which will give you more insight to who Jesus is. The word of their testimony, Jesus Christ. And he said, this testimony is the spirit of prophecy. To every one of us there is one word you need to know and speak it that is the testimony of Jesus when the Holy Ghost come upon you you shall receive power and this is what the power will do in you you will be witnesses of me both in Jerusalem Judea and to the uttermost part of the world this is the anointing of the Holy Ghost the anointing of the Holy Ghost every other thing is a surplus the main power of the Holy Ghost serves this purpose. You will be witnesses of me. Both in Jerusalem, in Judea. And this is where our victory is. When we uphold the word of his testimony. And we uphold the blood of his sacrifice. We give you praise, we give you glory. We magnify your name. Thank you for the privilege of fellowship. Thank you for the honor of your presence. Thank you, Father, for the honor of service in the kingdom. We bless your name. We exalt you. We honor you. Lord, we ask that you help us to glorify you all the days of our lives. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. God bless you. Thank you, choir. Lovely. You're welcome to Bible studies. I know some of you came straight from work. Some will still join us. It's a huge sacrifice, but it's also a testament of your love for God and for his kingdom. And so these Bible study sessions are very important because there are times when we look into the world and we try to find out not just what but we find out why and we also find out how it's easy to know what but what alone is not functional and it's not powerful enough to change your life a man who has knowledge functional knowledge is a man that beyond what knows why and knows how. What gives value to what you do and know 
is the reason behind what you do. Because if you don't know why, you will do things without ascribing the urgency, the seriousness, the purity required to get results or to get rewards. For example, you can give because you know Christians give or you came to a church and they told you to give. But if you don't know why you are giving, you may not give with the right motive. You may give the most, but you have the least of rewards. And so knowing why you do what you do is more important than knowing what to do. Because why is what gives you reward. And on the other hand, knowing how to do what you do is very important. Because what is what gives you, how is what gives you results. So you need to understand this. The reason we teach is to help us know what, how, and why. Because it's possible to know what and not know how. If you don't know how, you have no results. And it's possible to know how and not know why. If you know how, you may have results, but you may not have reward. Praise God. For example, you may know that it's important to give, but you don't know how to give. And if you don't know how to give, you will not have results that comes with giving. And you may know how to give, but you don't know why you are giving. And so you don't give with the right motive, and you will not have reward in eternity. So it's important to know these three things. This is why in a Bible study like this, we try. looked at the doctrine of the new creation. We looked at the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. We looked at the doctrine of, what's the fourth one we looked at now? Evangelism and so in it. Now we are considering growing in spiritual maturity. After now, I'm going to consider the elementary doctrines of Christ where we talk about baptisms and all of that. Praise God. It looks simple, but these are the things that define our belief system. And so we started last week trying to understand what spiritual maturity is because it's possible for you to misunderstand the whole subject. And I remember laying so much emphasis on gifts. And my emphasis was the fact that, that you are gifted. is not a sign that you are spiritual. Neither is it a sign that you are mature. This is why in 1 Timothy chapter 3, when the elders were ordained, no gift was mentioned. It was centered around character and integrity. Number two, I said you can be gifted and not spiritual. Because being spiritual is your ability to walk in the light of the word of God. That means the word of God controls your mindset or your mind. The word of God controls your emotions and the word of God controls your actions. If you have not come to that level, you may be seeing angels every day, but you are not spiritual. This is why in 1 Corinthians 3, from verse 1, Paul told the Corinthian church that was obviously the most gifted church that were carnal and they were base. Praise God. So we took time to look at that. And in order to bring more clarity, I gave us two major words used for maturity in scriptures. You can find it as mature, you can find it as perfect, but the two major words I gave us last week was teleos and katakizo. And I told us teleos has four meanings. Number one, it means to be finished. That means you have been worked on, you are a finished product. That means on a particular area, you don't need more development. Everything God needs to teach you, he's taught you already. So you know what God thinks on the particular subject matter. And you have the ability to do what God thinks. You see that in the Garden of Gethsemane, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 39 and 42. Jesus knew the will of God, even though it was not his will, he had the power to align with the will of God. So he is finished. Praise God. That's Telios. It also means 
not wanting anything to be complete. It also means they come a, to become a consummate man in integrity and in virtue. So when you say nay, your nay is nay. When you say yea, your yea is yea. Take it anywhere, that's how it is. You have come to that point where as touching integrity and virtue, you are without fault. And finally, I said, is to be full grown. That talks about responsibility. And I will talk about it here when I try to round up today. You come to the point where you are able to take responsibility. Then you are mature. The second word, maturity, we considered last week was the word katakizo. And there are two major things we, we, we looked at. Number one, we said, is the ability to be corrected, to be mended. So a mature person has the fortitude to receive correction and to apply correction. When you see a man who is not mature, he has a problem being corrected. Because his ego, his pride, his sentiment still have a way of controlling what he does. And so even though he knows what you are saying is truth, he doesn't have the power and the fortitude to accept it. He's full of himself. And he thinks he's so big, that's a very small boy. Praise God. And the second word we looked at was the word to be fully equipped. So when we say somebody is mature, it means he has the set of equipping needed to perform the function that is consistent with his destiny. You can have the right motive and the right intention, but may not be sufficiently equipped to carry it out. For example, we are doing ministry here. We may have the best intentions to achieve what God wants to achieve, but it will take equipping to bring it to pass. Good motives, good intentions are not enough. You need equipping to be able to deliver on the demands of your destiny. And so when you are able to achieve these six realities, then you are a mature believer. If you are gifted, thank God, that's an added advantage. It will speed up what God wants you to do. But beyond gifts, these are the definitions of maturity as far as the Bible is concerned. Anybody walking by the light of God's word, this reality will predominate its essence. Praise the Lord. And so in looking at the subject of maturity, we said it's so important. And every time you find people who are interested in building a generation, this is their cardinal emphasis. For example, I read out some scriptures for you last week. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, Jesus was admonishing his disciples and he said, Be ye therefore teleos, even as your Father in heaven is teleos. Be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That means the emphasis of Jesus to his disciples is to come to that point of full maturity. In James chapter 1, verse 4, James was admonishing the church and this was his emphasis. He said, let patience have her perfect work that you may be made perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So the work of James over the disciples that God gave him the opportunity to pastor was to bring them to maturity. And he told them clearly it will require a lot of patience to come to that point. Emotions can be momentary. Emotions can be instantaneous. It can be beautiful. It can be full of fun. But it does not have what it takes to bring you to that point of stature with God. And so he said, it takes a lot of patience to achieve that. Paul, talking about his ministry to the church in Colossus, in Colossians chapter 1 verse 28, concerning Jesus, he said, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man mature before Christ Jesus. Teaching and warning every man that we may present every man perfect before Christ Jesus. So the burden and the labors of Paul's ministry was not to really meet the needs of people as it were. In the course of administering ministry, the needs of people will be met. But the primary objective of Paul's ministry, as summarized in this scripture, is to teach, to warn, and to bring every man to that point of perfection so that when he presents them to Christ, we want nothing. Praise the Lord. So maturity, if you trace through the labors of the apostles of old, including our Lord Jesus Christ, maturity is the cardinal emphasis of what they do. When you see the minister in the spirit, 
they want to address the needs of people but when they are done with that they will sit with these people and build them up i remember teaching you on sunday on the apostolic culture and i told you one of the things that predominate the apostolic culture is the ministry of the word and i gave you a lot of examples in acts of the apostles chapter 5 we saw that peter was teaching in church ananias came in lied to him fell down died he kept teaching for another three hours until sapphira came she fell and died he continued teaching so they saturated the people inundated them dominated them with the word of god until they think the word they feel the word and they act the word you saw that paul was teaching in acts of the apostles chapter 20 and the bible said he taught into midnight and Eutychus fell asleep and fell down and died a man fell asleep Paul was not moved if you like sleeping why men slept the enemy sowed and if the enemy can sow why men slept then the word of God can be sown while you are yet sleeping and so Paul went down brought the man back to life nobody gathered and celebrated and said my God my God the resurrection for the dead is here the church was mature they knew it was a normal thing that was necessary at that time they brought the man back to the fellowship and Paul continued to because their primary objective was to get everybody to know the word to a degree that they think the word, they talk the word, they feel the word, and they act the word. If the church does not come to that point, that's an immature church, regardless of the signs and wonders taking place. Praise the Lord. And so this was the burden of the first apostles. And in order to give us more clarity to this emphasis, I said there were seven dimensions to maturity. And so I began to explain them. The first dimension to maturity, I said, it was the ability to discern the will of God and to live it. It's possible to be creative and intelligent, but you don't know the will of God concerning your life. Until you know the will of God concerning your life and you begin to live it, you are not spiritually mature. There are many gifted people who are confused. There are many anointed people who are confused and stranded about life and destiny. They can do anything, but at the end of the day, they are just being used as puppets. Either money becomes the motivation for what they do, or influence, or fame, or acceptance, and you see them doing all kinds of things, being tossed to and fro, because they don't know the will of God concerning their life. A man truly becomes mature when he discerns the will of God, and he begins to live it. In Ephesians 4.14, the Bible said that we henceforth be, not, be no more children. And the proof is that it's that being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, and by the slight of men, or by the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. That means we know the word of God with degree that we cannot be deceived, we cannot be taught to and fro. The cunningness of men cannot cause us to do what we are not designed to do. So we do what God wants us to do, when he wants us to do it, and how he wants us to do it. That's a sign of spiritual maturity. In this world today, men can manipulate you, bully you, force you to do what is not in your script. But when you are mature, regardless of the situation, you can tell anybody to the face, God is not interested in me doing this. And you have the power within yourself to turn back from whatever it is that God is not having you do. In Hebrews 13, 21, the Bible said too, that God will make you perfect in every good work, knowing his will. God will make you mature in every good work, knowing his will. That means... To be mature is to know the will of God. And I read for us again from Colossians chapter 1 verse 9. Paul said, for this cause, we also, the, from the day we heard of your faith, because he was talking about their faith in Christ Jesus, he said, we do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may be able to, number one, walk worthy of the Lord, number two unto all pleasing and number three to become fruitful in every good works that means when a man knows the will of god what happens is that he begins to walk worthy of the lord that means the standard of his life becomes the standard of god's life number two that man becomes pleasing to god and number three that man begins to produce results that are accepted by god and results that can generate reward in eternity praise the lord so knowing the will of God is very important. Rejected by God today because they are not doing what God asks them to do. And so a mature
if your primary objective is self-preservation you will compromise a thousand times in one lifetime and so when a man wants to function by the wisdom of god he has to detach from everything that makes self-preservation cardinal in james 3 verse 17 the bible said the wisdom that is from above that is the wisdom of god he said it is first of all pure it is peaceable it is gentle it is easy to entreat it is full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy so when you find a mature believer his life is pure his life is peaceable a mature believer is not somebody who wants to scatter create chaos just to prove he's stronger a mature believer is one who advocates for peace regardless of what happens he can choose to go down just to ensure that peace is attained. Peter was teaching us and he said that to strive to have peace with all men. That's what mature people do. Their goal primarily is not to prove it's right or who is wrong. Their goal is to ensure that at least peace thrives. And when you find people who operate by that kind of wisdom, you have found a mature believer. Number three, he said they are gentle people. They are not haphazard. When you find young people, their life is all about energy, emotions. At some level, it's good, but when you get mature, you think of facts. You are not too moved by the emotions. I was sharing with Pastor Victor earlier today, and I said there's something wrong in our generation. So long as people are emotionally stirred when they are praying, they're satisfied. Even though they cannot trace the results that their prayers are commanding. So long as people are listening to a message and they are exercised, they are excited, they are satisfied. Even though they cannot trace transformation in their lives, they cannot see the impact of that message in their life, they don't care. So long as it excites them, they are good. And any message that doesn't excite them cannot get their attention. It's a sign of immaturity. Yes, emotions are good. They are the flavors of the soul. But when you get mature, you know that life is beyond emotions. Praise God. And so he said, this kind of wisdom is gentle. And he said, this kind of wisdom is easy to entreat. In fact, the Holy Ghost started teaching me this thing recently. And I'm still learning it. I'm a baby in this one. <laughs> that I'm teaching this, don't make the mistake of thinking this is a very mature believer. I'm a student in this school. Praise God. I make mistakes. God corrects me. More mature believers correct me. I learn from them. And I'm still learning. Praise God. While I'm teaching here, I can still make mistakes. Teaching the subject. spiritual things are quite funny. Praise God. So he said, this wisdom is easy to entreat. Few years ago, if you offend me, if you want to apologize, it's not enough just to say sorry. Because when you say sorry, I can pick offense in how you said sorry. I'm more sensitive to how you said the sorry. I can draft a thesis out of the sorry you said. I can show that that sorry you said showed that your heart is not correct. I can show that from that sorry you said, it means you are proud. I can show that from that sorry you said, it means you have not repented. I can draw a thousand and one things from, it would have been better you didn't say sorry. That you now say sorry, there's a problem. Even if I was thinking of forgiving you, now that you have said sorry, kind. That's not the wisdom of God. He said the wisdom of God is easy to entreat. That's why when a believer becomes really mature, sometimes he doesn't even wait for you to ask for, for forgiveness. Because he knows that himself was forgiven. That's why he's standing. The reason we forgive is not because those we forgive are worthy of it. The reason we forgive is because ourselves know that we are standing because we are forgiven. So we forgive because we are forgiven. Because Jesus forgave us, we no longer have the right to bear grudges against one another. I read to you the story of the, the slave that would not forgive. He was forgiven of his own debt, and then he took somebody else and put him in prison. Because he didn't do that, he became a prisoner in the process. That's why I said to forgive one another as our Heavenly Father has forgiven us. So when you find a mature believer, he's easily entreated. When you find people who claim something must happen, they must do this, they must... It's childishness. If your spirit is sensitive, you'll just be irritated. You don't need somebody to lie down and kill himself before you forgive him. If he doesn't even realize it, forgive him. Forgive him ahead of time. Jesus was teaching Peter this subject and the apostles. 
and told them, if your brother sinned against you seven times in the day, forgive it. Peter now said, is it seven times? Because he asked. Jesus now said, no, it's seven, 70 times seven times. That means you are to forgive 400, one person 490 times in a day. He did say if he asks for forgiveness primarily. It's good if the ask for forgiveness is a sign of repentance. Now, imagine if you are commanded to forgive one brother 490 times in a day. What if you have 10? You see the depth. It looks simple, but these are matters of depth. 490. That means it's a sin to, to hold grudges against another person. But these are the definitions of maturity in the scripture. Easily entreated. He said that 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 wisdom is full of mercy still speaking in line with what we have said it's full of mercy today people are happy to see others destroyed because as far as they are concerned that's a lesson to them it's a sign of gross immaturity did you read about abraham and lot abraham took lot built him up and lot men began to fight with abraham's men and when abraham came to lot lot was quick to choose the side he wanted the Bible said he looked at the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. It was full of vegetation and he ran towards the plain. Years down the line, Sodom and Gomorrah was attacked and they carried Lot and his entire family and everything he owned. It is our world today. <laughs> Abraham, we just have. He didn't know that he was nothing without me. <laughs> well, let him suffer for one year we will come back and start again and learn. That's our generation. The Bible said immediately, Abraham took 318 trained servants of his household. He divided himself among them and went after the kings to deliver Lot. When he delivered Lot, there was no writing anywhere that Lot knelt down and said, thank you. He delivered Lot and let him go back to face his life. That's why he became a father of all nations. It's not just because he gave birth to Isaac. God saw the largeness of his heart. It's called maturity in the kingdom. Too many people are not mature. And if there is one thing we need to start trusting God for, really, is for true spiritual maturity. So it's full of mercy and good fruits. Without partiality. Because we looked at it last week. Number three, I say when you are mature, you walk in love. Find a mature believer, the characteristic that dominates such a person is love. And of course, you know that love is sacrifice. So I gave us five dimensions out of the many dimensions of love last week. Number one, I said is selflessness. You find somebody who is mature, one thing that dominates his lifestyle is selflessness. Number two, I said is humility. Number three, I said is forbearance. Number four, I said it's kindness. And number five, I said it's faithfulness. All of these are definitions of love. A man who truly is in love with a person or a people cannot express that love without selflessness and sacrifice. It's impossible to express love without selflessness. It's impossible to express love without humility. You have to bring yourself down to be able to express love. That's why Jesus came down from heaven. If God sat in heaven and said, I love you, all of us would have perished. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And we saw in Philippians chapter 2 from verse 5, that Jesus did not just come down. He stripped himself of divinity. And he put upon himself the garment of flesh. And he said he died the death of a criminal. That's the highest level of lowliness anyone can go. So you can't express love without going down you can't express love without humility you cannot express love without forbearance because the people you are relating with they won't come to your frequency overnight it will take time they need to learn what you believe examine those things until it becomes their conviction and then they begin to align themselves with them with those things if you find high level intolerance you know that love has not really been developed in this person. And I told you that that's an area I'm struggling with. Because I, 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 I can't tolerate incompetence. 
when you have to do something I've taught you this thing over and over you can't do it and you make the same mistake over and over sometimes I'm wondering what is happening to your brain <laughs> and then God told me is it because you have been helped you know so learning to grow in love one of the areas God is really training me is the area of tolerance and I told you last week that this tolerance is not the gay kind of tolerance <laughs> it's an abomination before God so if it's that tolerance we will never learn it it's against the will of God praise the Lord so don't come and say you are a lesbian let's tolerate you and wed you we will never do it if you don't repent we will kick you out of among God <laughs> or we pray that God will touch your heart to repent in Jesus name and so I spoke of kindness how you speak matters he said let your words be seasoned with grace that you know the truth does not mean you can say it anyhow. It's not enough to know the truth. It's a speaking the truth in love. Most times what people call truth is a communication of the bitterness that is in their heart. And so you are hearing somebody who claims is telling you the truth. But the bitterness, he was oppressed for the past five years, for the past ten years. And he's using this channel of communicating truth to pour out bitterness. And you are hearing somebody after a while, you become unforgiving. After a while, you become an angry person. After a while, you become so dangerous. You don't know the spirits that are imparted to you in the bead or in the name of hearing truth. So you've got to be discerning. Because most times, what we call truth is not truth. We are just trying to get back at other people. And so you need discernment to hear a lot of things. So love is full of kindness and of course it's full of faithfulness. Faithfulness, I told you, is the spirit of, of the comrade spirit where people can be loyal to one another even if it costs them their lives. It's a sign of true maturity. When people become mature, they can truly become loyal. And when people are loyal, they are faithful allies. Praise God. Number four, I say maturity is the ability to control your tongue. In James 3 verse 2, it says, If any man offend not in words, he is mature and able to subject the body. And so control over the tongue is not just um, being diplomatic to say the right thing from things from the wrong things. It's actually a state of rulership over the flesh. You have authority over your flesh. Your flesh no longer dictates for you. Your emotions don't dictate for you. No matter what happens, you are able to gather yourself to present what ought to be presented the way it should be presented. In Proverbs 16, 32, it said, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty man. And it said, He that ruleth his spirit is greater than him that taketh a city. That's the same thing James is trying to corroborate in James chapter 3, verse 2. The ability to rule over yourself. And Paul, re-emphasizing this, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25 and 27, he said, every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. That means he has the power to keep himself under control. In verse 27, he said, I keep my body under subjection. I beat it and bring it under subjection. So there is a place where you build internal energy sufficient to mortify the flesh through the Holy Spirit. And you are not ruled or controlled by your feeling. You find in mature people, they are regulated by emotions terribly. They are shouting in joy now. The next minute they are depressed. The next minute they are full of He has the ability to go through things in order to achieve what God wants him to achieve. I'm outlining these things so when I begin to teach you how to build it, you will pay attention. Praise God. You know, somebody said, the way we present Christianity is impossible. That nobody can attain it. The truth is that nobody can attain it. That's why we need grace and the help of the Holy Ghost. Christianity is not something you attain by your abilities. The flesh is already judged. And it has been judged to come for nothing. Jesus said the flesh profits nothing. Paul said, oh wretched man that I am. So Christianity is not something you can ever imagine or think you can attain by your human abilities. The only way you can be a Christian is by grace and by the ability of the Holy Spirit on your inside. Without that, you will fail a million times. In fact, if you attempt to be a Christian by your own ability, it means you don't have the right estimation of the flesh. You that is firing in tongues now, 
who is seeing visions of heaven you will be shocked that the next five minutes you already lost him for a woman and then you are asking yourself how did i move from heaven to hell that's the speed of flesh <laughs> that's why i say him that is standing should be careful lest he falls and i've told you before any man you see standing is helped of god that's why self-righteousness is a scam but we will not lower the standard just to accommodate people we will say it the way it is so that everyone will know that without grace it can't be attained and this is why christians are the only people that have saviors have a savior because we can't do it so we need a savior to be able to do it and so for you to be a christian god must help you praise god so the fourth dimension of maturity is the ability to rule the flesh the fifth dimension of maturity is to live by faith live by faith is actually the ability to live above the realm of facts or sensory perception the bible said in second corinthians 5 7 it said we walk by faith not by sight it's a realm not everybody are there because in second corinthians 4 13 paul said according as it is written he said they believe and have spoken we having the same spirit of faith we believe and therefore we speak so it's something you discern and live by it is easy for you to live by facts it will take a lot of work with god through the scripture and the holy spirit to come to that point where you say i will only accept fact fact if it aligns with the word of god if it doesn't align with the word of god it doesn't matter what i feel i will stand with the word of god you will go through a lot of training to get there i told you my story last week how that i heard the story smith wigglesworth said him and his wife will never take drugs again i said that is where i am all of us are born of god all of us are faith romans 12 3 said unto everyone is dealt the measure of faith if smith wigglesworth can do it i can do it and it's very true but you see how and so i started that week i went to play football <laughs> and in the term in the intensity of the game i was hitting the ball <laughs> too frequently and i discovered my grain originated from one side what do i do i sat down and said no way no after a while tears started coming out of my eye <laughs> i now remember the story of the woman that put scripture in water and drank i put the scripture i kabashed in tongue when i finished i drank the water it now started acting like hammer before i was feeling the pain i couldn't trace where it was now the pain became specific bam gone <laughs> i stood up i say where's the paracetamol in this <laughs> let's occupy this faith with paracetamol <laughs> because only the living serve the lord <laughs> we have to be alive to learn this faith work if we die they don't learn faith in the grave and so while you are great growing take drugs my brothers and sisters but as you keep building, as you keep building, a point comes where you subdue these things. You won't even know. You won't know again. You subdue it because you've put it to work over and over. You may not get what you are looking for the first time. You may not get it the second time, the third time, the fourth time. Keep at it. The Bible said in Habakkuk 2.4, in Romans 1.17, in Galatians 3.9, it said the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith so you keep practicing you keep practicing until your faith grows and hebrews chapter 5 verse 12 and 14 he said whoever uses milk is a babe and is unskillful in the word of righteousness that's one scripture that gets my attention that means the word of righteousness is a word of skills it's not something that just happens if you want to live above sin now it's not to start fighting the sin no forget the sin the sin is a response to an act you want to fight immorality you need a lot of skill you will come to the holy spirit to help you and drop your burdens there and then as you leave the holy spirit every gate everything that opens the gate of the eyes the gate of the ears the gate of the body you start censoring it you may need to delete things from your phone for a period of eight months you may need to stop hearing some things because all of those things are energy transmitters as they are entering you no matter the help the holy ghost renders you you can't come out of it and so you need skill a lot of skill 
you may need to censor your friends the ones that are vulgar you will leave them for six months they will go and say you are proud you are arrogant don't hear it if you hear it it may affect you ignore them when somebody calls the person's name start talking about music they will come to your room and say this person say like this you will say did you hear what they said about uh, labor party <laughs> They, you have changed the conversation is key because you know when you say it something will enter your heart that's how you master a point comes when you become a giant and nothing can pull you down anymore but you will get there by skill so it says strong meat belongs to them who are of full age who by reason of use have exercised their senses to discern between good and evil so the word exercise is by emphasis you keep putting yourself to it applying yourself to it until you grow up it's called the faith work some of you you know that you are supposed to be a giant in the tech industry you may need to start with a whatsapp group you may need to start with a youtube page and you are building it a point will come you will get there but if you want to start with an app all your faith and all your savings will crash and you will not go anywhere in fact your faith will so crash that you'll not be able to try again so the life of faith is gradual but progressive and consistent if you do it until you master it you have become a mature believer a point comes when you don't see facts most of the things the great men of old that we read of did if you study the scripture you discover they didn't have the ability for it when they started but they have known the way of faith and so as they kept doing it they became masters and when you become a master you will start talking from the faith realm ordinary men will look at you and say are you okay did you read about jesus in john chapter 11 lazarus was dead they sent for jesus that your friend is sick go and heal him he didn't go when lazarus died he now said lazarus is asleep uh -uh. thomas say i'm a man of fact oh. If he's asleep, he will wake up. Jesus had to come down to the arena and say, okay, he's dead. If you master faith, eh, you'll be talking about a project of 100 million. Those who are around will think you have 990. <laughs> they think you have 90 million in your account. That's why you are talking like this. When they have the opportunity of checking your account, they will now discover you have 150,000. And you are talking about 100 million. What do you mean? Are you okay? You are not in that realm you have moved consistently in scripture jesus called the dead sleep when he came to jairus's house to raise the gear from the dead he said she's asleep the people started laughing at him but he was talking from the faith realm when you find people who are too fact oriented if you ask them they'll say no me i'm based on fact i'm not they they call those who operate by faith religious they say all these religious people i don't i'm not they don't know the world it will take training to get there but when you become mature you begin to operate by faith second corinthians 4 17 and 18 paul said our light afflictions are but for a moment he said but they work for us an exceeding weight of glory he said why we look not at the things which are seen why we look not at the things which are seen but at the things that are unseen he said, for the things that are seen, they are temporal. But the things that are unseen, they are eternal. So these are the two things that makes for faith operation. Number one, your focus is not fact. If your focus is fact, you will fall. Every man walking by faith is focused on what God is saying. What God is saying may not be feasible, but that's where he's looking at. And eventually he will get there. The second operational modality for this operation is that you know and you have convinced yourself that this mountain is temporary. If you are not able to look at the unseen and if you are not able to convince yourself that what you are going through looks as if it will kill you but is temporary, you can never walk by faith. You want to walk by faith, these two things will become cardinal ingredients of your life. I know now you don't have any money but God is telling you, you are going to run a company. All you are seeing is about companies. You are on YouTube for four hours. They say, what are you doing? You are studying about the best companies in the world. You are drawing policies. You are drawing structures. You are drawing strategy. And they are asking you, which year will you start? That's not the problem. I'm studying what I am. You don't know it. You don't have it yet. But that's where your eyes are. 
A man who doesn't have faith is waiting for the day they will dash him one million. When you ask him what is the problem, he says, I don't have capital. You will never have capital. Because the first capital you have is not money. The first capital you have is faith. And so when you find that man, he's looking at the unseen. He's drawn into the unseen. He's overwhelmed by the unseen. He lives in the unseen. And then this temporal thing that is trying to defile him, he keeps telling himself, this night, there must be daybreak. This night will not remain like this. He falls down, he stands up again. He says, maybe this is twilight. I may just be lying down at the wrong time. Daybreak can just be one second later. And so he keeps standing. He keeps standing. He keeps standing. Nothing can defile him. You find such a man, that's a mature believer. And that's why you find men of faith never compromising. Because they know everything they are going through is temporal. The only thing that is eternal is what God told them. That's why you find men of faith, they start certain things at the most unbelievable time. Some men start at 50. And they told you life ends at 40. If you are a fool at 40, you are a fool forever. Not in the corridor of faith. Smith Wigglesworth began at 45. He shook the world. Some start at the age of 15. And then you say, no, no, you are a teenager. You can't. It's not age-oriented. It's faith-based. So age cannot determine what you do. Some people might even come and look at you and say, hello, boy. They want to remind you that you are a kid. <laughs> you will tell them there are two kinds of age. There is a chronological age in time and there is a divine age in light. Somebody you call a boy might be your grandfather in the spirit because he's walking by technology you don't know. It's called faith. So Paul told Timothy, say, let no man despise thy youth. Don't let anybody. If your character is intact, you are good to go. So a mature believer functions by faith. Never quit. Quitting is a sign of immaturity. Stand your ground. That thing you are going through, somebody went through it and changed it. And if one person changed it, it means you no longer have the right to quit. You can only quit if nobody has done it before. But if somebody has done it, then you have no right to quit. And the Bible already gave us an answer. It said there's nothing new under the sun. It said there's no temptation that is peculiar to you. That thing you are going through, somebody went through it and it turned it to a testimony. And you too will not turn your back until it becomes a testimony. It's called the faith life. The faith life sees every challenge as temporal. And the faith life sees only what God says as the true reality. Get there and you are a mature believer. Number six, which is where I start tonight. That one was, this is recap for those who are not here last week. <laughs> Praise God. But hope you have started practicing what you've heard. How many of you practiced what you heard last week? How many, how many of you forgave somebody last week? Who did he ask for forgiveness? You forgave. Because how many of you? That's good. Because this teaching will be a waste if you don't apply it. That's why I'm taking my time. Number six. A mature believer lives above sin. Remember, Matthew 12, 48. He said, be ye perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Your heavenly father does not sin. Is it possible? Yes. I'll read three scriptures for you from the Gospel of John to explain something. You know, teaching is difficult. It takes a lot of grace to be able to communicate the counsel of God. Especially if you are a traveling person. That's why most travelers are preachers they hardly teach because it takes a lot of wisdom it takes a lot of grace to be able to teach let me explain why you can be talking to a group of people about prosperity because of where they are and your emphasis will be diligence and hard work because that's what they can take and so you tell them in order to prosper you have to walk with your hands. They can relate with it. They can understand it. And they can release their faith for it. Because even before they met God, they were working hard. 
And so when you teach them prosperity from the context of hard work, it will be easy for them to release their faith and they will prosper. But that's a level of truth. There's another level of truth that causes men to prosper beyond what they qualify for. Where grace comes in, where supernatural breakthrough comes in, that level does not operate just on hard work. That level operates by a higher economy. It's called covenant. Now, if you are teaching giving on the strength of covenant because your church is mature, so to say, and somebody else hears it who is not there and doesn't know where you are coming from, he may just walk into that congregation and say, they are sick. Sick, look at these people. They are brainwashed. They are stealing their money. And when people give, when you teach like that, the person will be so shocked. You mean these people? They are falling to these cheap, these cheap tactics. And he thinks it's wise. Because all he knows is that you prosper when you work hard. When you are diligent. When you are focused. But every man operates at that level. What is the supernatural element? I did a teaching recently on prosperity. And I, I was talking about working hard. They said this is the true preacher in Nigeria. As far as... <laughs> As far as they were concerned, every other preacher was a thief. But it shows you the level where the world is. There is something you call national consciousness. That's why we bombard everywhere with the word of God. There are certain things you can never see in the generation. Except as the national consciousness is heightened in the spirit. This is why sometimes we pray for certain things they don't happen. It's not because our prayer is not effective. Is because the national consciousness level is low. So, for example, if you are talking about supernatural invasions or supernatural breakthrough or supernatural occurrences in a territory, it may take 50 years before it happens. You can prophesy it, but it may never happen. The reason is because the faith level and the national consciousness is very low. So, the people can't receive it. And so no matter how you prophesy it, you may need to teach other people to begin to teach it, to saturate the atmosphere before such dimensions can come. When you study Africa, for example, there are certain parts of Africa where there is so much extremism and certain kinds of corruption. And when you trace their history, they didn't have fathers that taught truth in those lines. And so no matter what you say, you can't help them immediately. It will take a time for that consciousness level to be grown. If you come to Nigeria, for example, it's natural to honor elders. It's natural to honor those who are ahead of you. Not because you read it from the Bible. But the people that came ahead of you, they did a thorough work in that area. So naturally, the moment you give your heart to Christ, it's easy for you to release your faith in that dimension. Are we together? Because the national consciousness level is high. This thing makes teaching very difficult because when you are teaching a people, somebody may hear what you are emphasizing based on the people you are talking to and they will call you an erroneous teacher because of what he heard you say. But what he doesn't know is that you are teaching that because that's the level of faith the people are and that's what they can receive. Jesus said, I have many things to teach you. He said, but you cannot receive it. How be it when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all realities. I'm saying this because I want to say something about sin and maturity now. John was writing to the church and John addressed sin at three levels. The first level of John's address of sin is that if you sin, from 1 John chapter 2 from verse 1, he said, if any man sin, he said, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the propitiation for sin. What is John saying? That means it's possible not to sin and it's also possible to sin. Now, there are certain contexts where they have been taught the higher truth. And when you say somebody is sinning, they say, no, a believer cannot sin. That's not true. It depends on the level of the believer you are talking about. John said, if anyone sins. So when you are teaching in a place where they are still prone to sin, what you will be teaching them primarily is forgiveness. Because the way they can graduate from here is not when you threaten them. It's when they know the love of God. Because the love of God constrains us. For we thus judge 
that whoever if we just judge that if one died for us then they that live no longer live for themselves but for they for him that died for them now when you find a preacher who is dealing with believers at this level you can say no he is giving people license to sin that's wrong that's the level where these people are if they don't know the love of god they can never come out of sin because they are still under the weight and the power of sin second corinthians 5 14 taught us that it is the love of god that breaks this in fact if you read romans chapter 1 verse 32 the bible said these people know that the anger of god is against sin and they that sin he said yet they don't just sin but they have pleasure in those who sin so they are not afraid of hell you can talk about hell from morning to night they are not moved tell them about the judgment of god they are not moved the way to deal with these kinds of people is to expose them to the love of god and the way you teach them the love of god is through the forgiveness that was procured for them this is why they label some preachers in the body of christ as erroneous teachers because they say they give license for sin they are only teaching forgiveness it's a level and john knew this but after john talked about this in first john chapter 2 verse 1 john now went to first john chapter 2 verse 12. he said i write unto you children because your sins have been forgiven you for his namesake these ones have migrated from if you sin these ones have come to a point where they know that their sins have been forgiven them so they are no longer functioning at that level where they are prone to sin they now know the love of god so they are learning to become reasonable christians because now they know that their sins have been forgiven them not because they ask god for forgiveness remember in first john 2 verse 1 he said we have an advocate from the father that means we need to ask for that advocate to procure sin at this level these people know they are forgiving not because they ask for forgiveness they know they are forgiving for his name's sake so these ones know what jesus did for them and they have become reasonable christians now john went further in first john chapter 3 verse 7 and verse 10 now he's talking to a more mature people And see what John said. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. The first children he spoke to, he said, if you sin, you have an advocate. The second children he spoke to, he said, you are forgiven for his namesake. He's now talking to another children. He said, don't make the mistake of living in sin. If you are sinning, you are not the child of God. In fact, in verse 10, he made it more hard. And this is what John said. 1 John 3 verse 10 In this the children of God Are made manifest from the children of the devil Whoever doeth not righteousness is not of God Neither he that loveth not his brother If you read verse 9 before here John said Him that is born of God sinneth not He was graduating them from one level to another level From one level Now this is what people tell teachers If you find a teacher teaching and he said your sins are forgiven and then you find the same teacher teaching tomorrow that you shouldn't you can't sin they will now say this person does not have conviction today he's teaching one tomorrow he's teaching another it's not about conviction it's a skill in the ministry of teaching you address people based on what they can receive and then you carry them gradually but the emphasis i'm making tonight is that those who still deal with sin they are children you saw that all occasion when he was dealing with sin he called them what my little children my little children my little children why is that so when you become an elder you are perfect as your heavenly father is perfect elders don't sin are you seeing that so while you walk with god one thing you need to strive for is the ability to begin to live above sin because it's possible if it were not possible check that scripture for me quickly please i think it's first john 3 verse 9 is that the scripture first john 3 9 where he said he that is born of god sinneth not okay who whosoever is born of god doth not commit sin for his seed remaineth in him and hear what this guy is saying are you hearing what this guy is saying and he cannot sin he has come to a point where 
he is under the government of the Holy Spirit. He cannot say. He's not talking about spirit. Some will tell you this is spirit. He's not talking about his soul and body. The guy was talking to a whole being. He said he does not sin because his seed remained in him. That means the word of God in him stops him from sinning. Because that seed is the word of God. In Psalm 119 verse 9 and 11. David said how shall a young man keep his ways? He said, by taking heed unto thy word. He said, thy word have I put in my heart that I may not sin against you. That's why John said, the word, the seed remains in him. So a mature believer actually lives above sin. When somebody is still struggling with sin, no matter the title, he's still a babe. Ah, ah, ah. Ah, ah, ah. You know the teachers that came ahead They struggled, they couldn't So they made it look as if All of us are sinning It's not true They are men who are not sinning I'm not one of them yet You know, sin is a complex subject, and I will teach on sin one of these days. The Bible said, Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. When they talk sin, some people are thinking immorality. That fear that stopped you from doing the will of God is sin. Is that serious? <laughs> Whatsoever is not of God is sin. When people are teaching the subject of sin, some even assume that sin is only fornication. So every time they say sin, they, fun they say fornication. When you say lie, they say, well, God is helping you. <laughs> James said, if you fought in one, you fought in all. The man who lies is a fornicator. It's high-mindedness to think that this person is a bigger sinner than me. Your little exaggeration is equivalent to fornication in the spirit. That's how serious this matter is. Jesus said, you have heard before that if you sleep with another woman, you are guilty of immorality. He said, I tell you now, if you look at a woman lustfully, you have already fornicated with her in your heart. You see why Christianity is unattainable without grace and the help of the Holy Ghost. But there are men that have given themselves to God to a point where they have mastered the flesh. They live above sin. Those are mature people. That's why it's good to honor mature believers. We are not the same. We are different levels. Don't allow arrogance rob you of things in this kingdom. And finally, maturity a mature believer takes responsibilities you find an irresponsible believer that's an immature believer Galatians chapter 4 verse 1 he said the heir so long as he's a child is not different from a servant even though he is the lord of all he said therefore the father places him under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father that means irresponsibility in the kingdom is a product of ignorance when the person is taught he begins to take responsibilities when he's not taught he doesn't take responsibility so immaturity in this context is a lack of spiritual understanding you saw Paul's prayer in Colossians 1 9 he said that you may know the will of God in all spiritual understanding the word child in this scripture is actually the word nepios. It means to be void of understanding. To be inconsistent in knowledge. And that inconsistency makes it difficult for you to be responsible. I give you an example of such people. They come to church, they sweep the floor, and you say, thank you so much. You are such a wonderful person. The Lord bless and increase you. Next week they will be excited to sweep the floor. The next time they sweep the floor and you say, ah, you rebuke them. Next week, the leader of that unit, we have to send 10 SMS before they come. Because they fluctuate. Their responsibility is based on how much thanks and gratitude you show. They are immature. When you find a mature believer, he sees the house of God as his father's house. So he commits himself to it not waiting for anybody why will you thank me is he your father's house and me i'm a stranger 
that you are thanking me for what I did for my father. Allow God to say well done. Don't tell me well done. That's a mature person. He has come to that level of understanding. And so he takes responsibilities in the kingdom. And I tell you three kinds of responsibilities every mature believer must take. The first is personal responsibility. The second is corporate responsibilities or being responsible for others. The third is kingdom based responsibilities. And I explain this to you quickly. A responsible believer takes personal responsibility, corporate responsibility, and kingdom responsibility. Let me explain this to you quickly. Personal responsibility is fourfold for the purpose of clarity. Number one is spiritual. Number two is mental. Number three is financial. And number four is social. There are many people today they take a lot of spiritual responsibility but they are socially irresponsible and they don't know that their social irresponsibility brings reproach to the name of God and so because the guy is an apostle he shows up and says anything he wants to say without courtesy and then you find the gaps in his utterances bringing reproach and condemnation to the name of the Lord and because he thinks when he says, ha, ah, people falls down. Everything he does is correct. Most of the reproach the body of Christ suffers today is because of socially irresponsible believers. Most of the reproach we suffer today is because of financially irresponsible believer, believers. Because they find themselves financially irresponsible, every time they are under pressure, they begin to cut corners to meet up and balance those financial pressures and they begin to do things that dent the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. So a believer who takes personal responsibility takes spiritual responsibilities, mental responsibility, financial responsibility and social responsibility. Spiritual responsibility, of course, you know that already. I've shared with you a couple of times in, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. The Bible says, study to show yourself approved unto God. A watchman that need not be ashamed but rightly dividing the word of truth everything we have shared knowing the will of God functioning by the wisdom of God walking in love are all the things you want to achieve that's why you take spiritual responsibility and the way to route it is by studying the Word of God so when you find a believer who is not studying the Word of the Lord he is highly spiritually responsible he may not know but when there are issues in his life you will see him functioning by the philosophies of men. The steps he takes in remediating the crisis of his life is a testimony of his spiritual responsibility because he doesn't know what to do at certain given times. And the reason is because he didn't study it so he doesn't know it. Some people are so irresponsible they think their pastors, prophets and apostles should take care of all their spiritual needs. And when they reach out and you are not available, they get offended. What kind of pastor is this? What kind of apostle is this? What kind of prophet is this? How can he not be there for me? Oh God, you are the first prophet over your life. And so before you call for help, find out what the counsel of God says about your circumstance. I tell people a lot, the guy is looking for a job. He doesn't know what God says about it. He's look, he wants to get married. He doesn't know what God says about marriage. And he will not sit down to search the book. The Bible said in Isaiah 32 verse 16, it says, search ye out of the book of the law and read. Search, you search out of the book of the law and read. It says, none of these things shall fail. The mouth of the Lord has spoken it, his spirit has gathered it. In Joshua 1 verse 8, it said, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Thou shalt meditate upon it day and night to see that you do the things that are written therein. So when you find believers who can sit on the word of God, they are spiritually irresponsible. Every time they talk, they say, Pastor said this, Papa said this. That is babyhood Christianity. Papa may be excited that you quote him 50 times in one message, but it's a shame that God didn't tell you anything and you didn't find anything for yourself. That's why you come to places where people are not mature. They are talking for five minutes. They quote Papa 30 times. And Papa will be doing like this. You have not raised anybody. That's a junk. In the day of problem, you will see it. John 
3 16 matthew 4 12 that's how a believer speaks this is what the word of the lord says and he's dividing the word of truth that's why he says study to show thyself approved paul was speaking to his son timothy in first timothy 4 13 he said until i come give attendance to reading to exhortation and to doctrine some of the people we trained here last month they, they completed the 90 days training i told them we'll read the whole bible in 90 days come and see trouble he show you how rusty we have become i mean terribly rusty study the bible in 90 days i even took time to do a breakdown all the verses they should the chapters we should read i think it was an average of 14 chapters for 90 days for where it takes less than two hours 30 minutes to read the to read 14 chapters but it will show you our level of maturity spiritually we are irresponsible number two around spiritual responsibility is prayers in first thessalonians 5 17 it say pray without ceasing a spiritually responsible prayer is a prayer i'm not saying it's a prayer man i say it's a prayer somebody who dance is called a dancer somebody who plays is called a player a prayer man is a prayer that means he prays without ceasing while he's on the job he's talking to god and hearing god while he's driving he's talking to god and hearing god that's ardent responsibility it's not every time you pray because you have a body god can begin to entrust you with body because you have passed the discipline aspect of prayer a man who can pray by discipline will never sense burdens because if god releases it is a waste so before you start saying i have a burden to pray for nigeria have you prayed by discipline first can you maintain a prayer schedule for three months some people even the morning devotion for we are wake up in the morning ah, jesus when they are going to enter the bus you now say somebody will push them in the bus they will, they will stop what is your problem is this place not enough for you please be very careful that is the prayer that will power your destiny no wonder demons throw through your compound every week spiritual responsibilities prayer and the bible told us the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man that means the righteous man's prayer is what effectual and fervent and i've taught you here what that means it means long prayer it means consistent prayer i mean it means heartfelt prayer you begin to do that you are you are headed towards maturity and number three on spiritual responsibility is purity In 2 Timothy 2, 19 to 21, the Bible told us, say, nevertheless, the standard of the Lord standeth sure. They that name the name of the Lord must depart from iniquity. He said, for in a great house, they are not only vessels of gold or silver, but of wood and of hay. He said, if a man purges himself from these things, it takes a lot of responsibility to purge yourself from these things say then that man will be meet and qualified for the master's use this is spiritual responsible christianity on the scale of personal responsibility number two is mental responsibility many people all they know all they know are the messages they heard and the doctrines they are taught they go to school of School of business school. <laughs> I was sharing with you humorously last week. They are in a computer class. Somebody say, it is where God will help us. Another one jumps up and say, unless you give your heart to Christ, you will perish. Sir, that is a computer class. If you want to teach salvation, wait after the class and speak to the people. It shows that we don't know how society works. You don't double into a meeting and say give your heart to christ or die the person will just look and say what this chris chris by gods these fat fanatics are they okay 
Because sometimes our Christianity shows that we are not fit for our society. All those jumping in and out that you do, how many souls have you won? See the people making impact, they understand how society works. So they enter the system, there is an intelligence. The Bible says when Paul came to Corinth, he saw that they were littered, the place was littered with numerous gods. And he walked through the city. He had a body, but he walked through the city. He was studying the terrain. And he saw a symbol to the unknown God. And then he went to where people gathered and were talking. And he waited for his pawn to speak. And he stood upon the rock. And he began to address them. And intelligently, he presented his doctrine from an aspect that they understand. Intelligence. There is a mind aspect to what we do here. Two thirds of the New Testament was written by Paul. He's a lawyer. The fishermen were healing people by their shadow. But they couldn't accommodate most of their books. Does that mean they are not smart? No, they are smart. But there is a technicality. When Paul talks about spiritual gifts, he knows how to route it. When Paul talks about the church, Paul can talk about an athlete, he can talk about a farmer, he can talk about a soldier. There is vastness. So he can communicate through, through many channels. He can talk to anybody. It takes mental power to do that. In Daniel chapter 1 verse 20, the Bible said Daniel and his friends were 10 times better than their peers. Now, sometimes we teach you that God is not limited by our knowledge. So it doesn't matter whether you are educated or not. To show that what we do is not because we are mentally smart. So God can use an illiterate. But there is a level to which God cannot use an illiterate. God, we need somebody who is mentally inclined. And so every believer must study to show himself approved. And he must understand how society works. No matter the fire you carry. If you are an illiterate, you will be a nuisance in political corridor. There is a way they talk there. They can't just appear and start threatening everybody. They'll say, get out from here. What do you mean? <laughs> Most of these things we do. That's why our gospel in Africa affects only Africans. There are certain people you are talking. They sit down five minutes. They are trying to understand where you are going. Meanwhile, the first five minutes you are doing, Here nebo, akodea, halaba. If you want to pray, pray. When you want to preach, start preaching. Because the white man is looking at you. What is he saying? You say, the love of God. Oh, he logo mo, he gadaga. He no be lad. Ah, eh. The love of God. What is the love of God? The, they hear you for 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. They say, where is he going? What is he saying? I, I, I love his passion. But what is he saying? That's the way society works. When I went to Pakistan, I came down with my mistress. <laughs> if you carry mysteries there when you are talking the people will look at you and say this is African religion they will go home you need your mind should be developed so Christianity is not against science Christianity is not against philosophy Christianity is not against psychology but he uses it through the vent of purity and righteousness in order to affect a generation and so you want to be responsible you've got to develop your mind read books go to school don't run out of school because god is calling you somebody came here all the way from usuka why did you come 300 level doing well in school why she has a body and she wants to leave the university to go to a cave do you know how i felt that thing <laughs> you know what we felt some years ago i literally knelt down and was praying for God to show me a cave where we go for two years. I don't want to see the sun. I want to labor there in prayer and come out like Alexander Dewey. You think you are the only person with passion. I tell you, I go to a lot of universities. Many fellowship presidents are woof are failures. Check their CGPA 1.2. And then they hide it behind and they are shouting scripture. When they are writing exam, they are still writing carryover. They are in 400 level. They are writing 100 level carryover. When you ask them, they say, Kai, the burden of the kingdom is much. They, give, they, they are giving themselves to the Lord. You are a failure. Who told you, Paul? <laughs> That's why they can't 
model model good examples check inter check the internet today hear what pastors are saying you just ask yourself how did we get here a pastor wants somebody to sow seeds the person must come and lie down and hug his shoe i know there's a place where people are overwhelmed mary magdalene was weeping at the feet of christ but it's not a culture a pastor will come and step on somebody and is dealing with the devil in his life what kind of backwardness is that bringing reproach to the name of jesus christ it's because they are not educated it's not the holy ghost leading them many times our interpretation of the voice of god is through our mind and when you find an illiterate there's a way illiterates always hear god <laughs> if we want to affect our world we need to be mentally developed when you start it you will see the discipline it takes you will see you think you think you can succeed mentally when you are lazy no laxity can be accommodated there you will straighten up many preachers now can't even read they come and quote one scripture and tell stories for two hours that's why people are not growing it takes discipline you have to build your mind read books listen to people who are affecting the world find out how society thinks so that you can affect the soul of society this is the way the men of old function paul was quoting a poet of a city he went to not up to one week he said one of your poets said in him we live in him we move in him we have our being he said if we walk in him how can our god therefore be reduced to a graven image how did he know about that poet that means he was not ignorant he knew what was happening look at this christianity of uh, just priding around quoting scriptures uh, seeing visions and praying in tongues our minds the time has come for our minds to be developed they should be able to pick somebody from the church and say address the youth of this country and when he talks you know that somebody is talking that's christianity mental development people are quitting their jobs people are quitting university because they say they're on fire somebody traveled from university of Lorraine to come to me the mother was literally weeping he said this fire that this man has i must touch this fire and he's a medical student 400 level about to write mbbs and he left school the mother kept looking for my number and when he called me i said don't worry your son is coming back tomorrow when i sat the boy down he went back If you fail say i failed don't add god to it and train people to to develop their minds we need mentally inclined people if we must change our world all of you you are hearing peter obina everybody's clapping is it tongues is quoting it's economic intelligence prowess backed up with track record and you are not supporting him out of sentiment you know this guy is the answer if you like bring a prayer warrior 99 percent of christians today will choose him against that prayer warrior we need sound people for god's sake <laughs> number three <laughs> sometimes when i go to the universities i'm heartbroken Christians we gather, they can't talk chemistry, they can't talk physics, they can't talk biology. Everybody is shouting reviver, reviver, reviver. And no one has even read about reviver. They've relegated everything that has to do with the mind to the back. A fellowship president will show up with seven carryovers. Oh God, where were you? Did you attend lectures at all? And then you will be deceiving the younger ones. These are the prices we pay for seeking the glory of God. It's a lie. It's a lie. That's why we come to those campuses to tell you that prayer is a liar. What prices? How can they? The first time the Holy Ghost came, he rested on their mind. Read John, read Acts chapter 2, verse 4 in the amplified version and hear what he says. 
the bible said it will make you of a quick understanding in isaiah chapter 11 verse 3 quick understanding it said the spirit we have received second timothy 2 7 is of a sound mind the word is sophronismus the ability to discern articulate and produce results even that small child now is responding say this thing is true i'm weeping for my generation <laughs> <laughs> make up your mind and those students those who are students here listening to me both on ground and online go back and clear those carryovers and stop bringing shame to the name of them. <laughs> number three personal development is financial development and please don't get me wrong what I said now I'm not speaking against prayer that's why I spoke of spiritual development first Hope we understand. The third personal development area is financial development. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 8, Paul said, If you cannot provide for your household, he said you have denied the faith. He said you are worse than an infidel. Go and do a study on an infidel. A lady was talking to me the other day and we were having a discussion. Many sisters are afraid of marrying tongue-speaking brothers. Why? All they know and have is tongues. You have no coin in your name. And when you ask them, they say, Hmm, when the Lord appeared to me, He told me about the future. You don't know what you are missing. You know what God showed me. Africa is waiting for me. Africa. Oh, when the sister boldly leaves, he will now say they are canal. Oh God, wake up and walk with your hands. Wake up. Paul said, I walked with my hands. That's an apostle. He was a tent maker. There's a place of also laboring to make money. You must be financially responsible and developed. Don't be a body. That's why when Paul was teaching, he said. The widow that the church should take responsibility for should be three score old. That's 60 years. And there should be a record that she has served God faithfully, washed the feet of the saints, and is a, a, a woman of integrity. 60 years. Today you find a, boy, a brother of 25. He say, I have not eaten. The Bible said, He that stole shall steal no more but should walk with his hand that he may have to give. Go and walk with your hand. If you have not eaten, that's the very reason why you should think. Because it has been difficult for God to get your attention to think. Now that you are hungry, start thinking productively. Sometimes you are driving, you see somebody, 30 year old, he say, brother, show some love. Which, what is love? Which, which, which love is that? You are not blind, you are not deaf, you are not handicapped. Show love. What is that? Don't encourage any lazy man. Even if the person is your son, stop giving him food. Tell him to go and do something. People are so financially responsible and they are audaciously idle. That's why they have the audacity and temerity to do the wrong things. And some are so lazy, even when you give them, they spoil it. When people don't work for money, they take everything for granted. When you become mature, you, 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 you become personally responsible. And when you are personally responsible, the area of your finances will be one key aspect of you that will begin to respond. And finally, be socially responsible. Somebody says he's a Christian. You see him on Facebook with singlet. We will change this world. Don't you have a shirt? <laughs> you find a Christian walking. He can't even take his bath. He shows up with sanders. Ah, Alpha, what did they happen? The shirt is not ironed. And he's thinking you will take him serious because he came with a glory realm. Put your glory realm in the pocket. Tidy up yourself. <laughs> Be responsible. These are serious matters. 
they sound funny but this is a serious very serious issue The other day, a brother went somewhere and he was ministering in the spirit. And he blew on, his, on somebody and the person fell down. When the usher said the person, say, please, please, it's not the anointing. The stench that came out of his mouth. <laughs> the guy had... <laughs> you are going, you know, you blow on people and you can't buy brush and toothpaste. And you come, <sighs> Are you a dragon? Oh, oh, and the stench that will come out. If you want to blow on people, brush well. Don't be spiritually responsible and socially irresponsible. And when people look at them and address them the way they look, they are now offended. That they have no regard for the anointing. Touch not my anointing. And do my prophet no harm. Which anointed? So people should die because you are anointed. Some persons wear this, they clothes, they shed, they are wearing. They've used it for one week. They come back, they sweat on it, they put it on the sun. The next time they are going out, they carry and wear again. Where are they going for? Evangelism. And when they want to enter the room and the person perceive the other, they say, no, I will go and read the Bible. They are now offended that this city, they don't want evangelists. It's not the evangelism that is the problem. That shit, wash it. It's called social. It's called social responsibility. You will see somebody's suit you know they, they put this suit out of a bag. The suit is so squeezed behind. The suit and he's praying. And this has nothing to do with how many suits you have. You can have one shirt and wash it every night. Iron it and use the next day. And you will appear smart responsible and people will easily relate with you do you think somebody who takes his time to look good is not mindful of how good of what good looking entails and then you just show up you say accept one another in the name of the lord please please take social responsibility it's a sign of spiritual maturity paul said in first timothy chapter 3 verse 15 he said that you may know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the ground and the pillar of truth. There is a how to conduct yourself. There is a how. Not haphazardly. You have one shirt, wash it, iron it, come out clean, and you'll be addressed with integrity. Somebody told a story. Some persons went for IT, and they kept sending this particular set of people there were about four of them they were sending the other three consistently and one day they revolted why are you biased why don't you ever send this person the boss now told them don't you see how he's dressed will you send this kind of person to buy biscuit and you wear jeans and t-shirt you can buy biscuit across the road not somebody who is well talked in with time <laughs> it's not every kind of person that buy a car from the, the roadside so if you want to be addressed with dignity, then dress accordingly. Be presentable. We are too irresponsible socially. Even the way you speak can attract respect or disrespect to you. The way you speak, the way you address people, is a testimony of the quality of your spirit man. It's called the, the code of nobility. There's a way nobles talk. They don't talk carelessly. You don't talk carelessly. There's a way you speak. Did you find anywhere in scripture that Jesus spoke casually? Go and read the whole New Testament. Or talking or making jest. No. The Bible speaks against jest making. It's that serious. They say every idle word you speak, you account for it. 
there are certain words that you shouldn't be able to speak because everybody in society is saying them does not mean you should no you are noble you are noble it's a code and it's a sign and a testimony of the quality of your spirit i can tell you the way you dress is a sign and a testimony of the quality of your spirit man that's why it's important to take social responsibility the way they trained us if you find me in church with easy way just know that i was caught off guard maybe i came in from somewhere and i had to enter wear one shabby trouser throw no of course there is a modern way to dress with traditional attire now wear clean easy wear that's not you get what i'm saying but to appear carelessly and say no no it will be hard to catch a seriously mature believer of god he doesn't know what you are calling casual if it's what is time then it's what appearing is best you are coming to sit somewhere for three hours and you show up with a polo if if unless your three hours don't mean sense make me mean, mean so much to you it's a way believers function personal maturity it's fourfold spiritual mental financial and social we're out of time let me quickly round up second kind of maturity is corporate maturity remember we are talking about responsibility as a sign of maturity when a man truly start growing in the kingdom he quits thinking only about himself he starts taking responsibility for others and this four responsibility he takes for his personal best being he begins to take the same for others in colossians 4 12 he said epaphras is one of you a born servant of christ laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect mature and complete in all the will of god so if you take spiritual responsibility for yourself when you mature you start taking it for others you can fast and pray just to speak to somebody about jesus not because he paid you but you are taking responsibility for his soul you can give for somebody else to be saved not because it's your personal agenda you are mature we are doing project 5 million now we are buying equipment for another group of people who are doing project 1 million it's called responsibility for others so everything you are you start striving for everybody around you to be that thing when people are not mature they want to be the star and trample on every other person and if any other person begins to rise it's a threat to them they are children a man who is mature he wants others to either be like him or greater so he begins to take responsibility to bring out the best in them when you find people who kill the confidence of others dampen their confidence destroy their their, their god esteem know that they are not mature when you are mature it's your joy to see others excel much more than you because the bigger they become the faster the advancement of the kingdom this is why we give out our dress this is why we give out money this is why we pray for others this is why we give platforms so that others can become better than us because there is so little we can do standing alone but if we become many then our efforts and the results that follow becomes geometric so a mature believer takes responsibility for others and finally he particularly takes kingdom responsibilities and primary around kingdom responsibility is to win souls to the kingdom and to insist that god gets the glory anywhere you are you are in a place people are speaking against god you can't be quiet no you will rather lose a relationship than to be quiet you will insist that god takes the glory anywhere you find yourself god takes the glory you are that dogged this is what the the, the hebrew boys did shadrach meshach and abadnego on this matter oh king we will not speak with respect our god is able to save us but in case he doesn't we will not bow god must take the glory you can't sit down and say it's not my business no it's your business you sit with ladies they are defiling the name of the lord you stop them it's better you never sit together again than to be in a place 
where God is not glorified. You are a mature believer. You can bear the burden of God. Elijah said, I am terribly vexed for the Lord God of hosts. He said, the people have broken thy altars. They've killed thy prophet. I'm the only one left. He had passion and zeal for the Lord. Jesus showed up in the temple in John 2, 17. He saw the people de defiling the sacredness of the altar. The Bible said he made a whip of many cords and flogged them out of the temple. That was the only time. He did it twice. And that was the only time you see Jesus enraged so much in the Bible. Fighting for the glory of God. You can call him a bad name. You can make an enemy of him. That means nothing to him. If the glory of God is in contention, he's willing to let go of everything. That's maturity. They met him and said, what gives you the authority to do this? <laughs> it's not about the authority we are talking about here. God cannot be undermined where I am. I'll do it diplomatically. If that doesn't work, then things will end. We don't have to sit together again. It doesn't matter if you are the one who employed me. It doesn't matter. Ah, I'll leave it here. Those who are mature, they know. How do I build maturity? Having explained the seven dimensions of maturity. Two minutes. And I'm going to just mention it because we've taught it again and again and again. But now I want to mention it so that you know how to channel it appropriately. Number one, to build maturity, you stay in God's presence. The first perfect being is God. That's why Matthew 12, 48 said, be a perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. So you want to be mature, you have to stay in God's presence. And when you stay in God's presence, something happens. Metamorphosis. In 2 Corinthians 3, 18, he said, we all with unveiled faces. Remember, every born again believer is unveiled. If you study that scripture from verse 7, 8 to 15, the Bible said when Moses came down, he descended with the glory that fades away. He said, but we, as we turn to the Lord, he said, the veil is removed. And now said, we all with unveiled faces, beholding us in the glass, the image of the Lord. So when you turn to the Lord in salvation, the veil was taken away. Your job now is to stay. As you stay with God, you begin to interact with the image of the Lord and you are changed. You don't need to do anything. The image will change you. It's a principle in the spirit that what you see is what you become. That's why most of us didn't know when we became fornicators. We just looked at erotic things too long and the energy was built up. We find ourselves fornicating. The same way, if you look upon the Lord after a while, you will discover that you will take his nature and his image upon you. In 1 John chapter 3, from verse 2. No, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, yes. He said, when we shall see him, he said, we shall be like him. And you can't see him except as you stay in his presence. So you need to build consciousness and discipline to stay in God's presence. It's not just praying in tongues for four hours, three hours, one hour. It's not just reading 10, verse, 10 chapters of the Bible. It's actually a state of focus. After you have prayed, you become quiet. It said in Habakkuk chapter 2 from verse 1, it said, I will stand upon my watch and see if he will say or speak anything to me. And he said, he spoke and said, write the vision. When you stay, he will respond. He's a king. He said, they that wait upon the Lord, they renew their strength. They mount up with wings like the eagle. Many times, the reason Christians don't look like God is because they don't stay long enough in God's presence. Isaiah 40, 28 to 31. He said, have you not heard? Has it not been said to you that the everlasting God fainted not, neither is he weary? He giveth power to the faint, and unto them that has no might, he increaseth strength. He said, even the young men shall faint and be weary. And utterly fall. He said, but they that wait upon the Lord, they renew their strength. They mount up with wings like the eagle. So when you wait in God's presence, you become like God. When you study that scripture deeply, I don't have the time. The first thing it does, or it did in verse 28 and 29, is that it compared God with the young man. The young man is the strongest species of the human race. He said, but compared to God, the young man is weak. He's weary and he will utterly fall. But he went further to show us the bridge between our humanity and his divinity. He said, they that wait upon the Lord, suddenly they renew their strength. They mount up with wings like the eagles. The same way God runs, he's not wearied. He walks, he doesn't faint. Suddenly, the man begins to run and he's not weary. 
if you don't build the culture of waiting you can never grow in spiritual maturity number two to grow in spiritual maturity you must begin to act the word of god it's good to study it it's good to listen to it it's good to hear it it's good to know it but more importantly you have to act the word of god if you don't act the word of god you will not build capacity in the world it's not enough to know it's not enough to be aware you actually come to fullness in the ministry of the world when you begin to act it in first timothy 4 13 and 15 we saw the two expressions of this reality he said until i come give thyself to reading to exhortation and to doctrine this is how you get to know it he now went further he said give thyself wholly to these things in doing it your profiting will be made manifest to all so people know the word of god and they know a lot of it but they act very little of it any dimension of the world you want to become you have to act it if you don't act it you can't become it it's just like having a gym in your house and having a pot belly at the same time it's one thing to have a gym it's another thing to have six pack having a gym does not translate to a six pack six pack is engaging the gym and so somebody else who has no gym may have so much six pack and the man who has a gym can be an obese many know the word of god they never act it they know about praying for the sick never pray for the sick they know about studying never study they know about giving never giving that's why they never become that's why i said always hearing the truth never coming to the knowledge or to the fullness of the same ever hearing ever learning but never becoming you never become except as you begin to act the word so you don't need to know the whole bible to be mature the little you know from today start acting it some of you all you know is giving to the poor make a timetable don't even give to church what you know is giving to the poor start from there every month go to an orphanage give something do it for two years your capacity will begin to enlarge some of you all you know is to be kind to others start consciously being kind some of you all you know is forgiveness start forgiving as you start acting the world you'll see that your growth suddenly becomes rapid. The Bible said in 1 John 2 verse 5, it says, Whoso keepeth his word, the love of God is perfected. You keep it, you live it, you act it. Number three, how do you grow unto maturity? By submitting to those you have a witness have grown in that dimension in hebrews chapter 6 verse 12 the bible said follow after them who through faith and patience obtain the promise follow after them who through faith and patience obtain the promise one aspect is faith another aspect is patience there are certain men that have perfected certain dimensions when you see them the Holy Ghost bears witness. I'm not talking about what people are saying. I'm talking about the witness of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost tells you, this man has character. Learn character from him. The Holy Ghost tells you, this man has faith. Learn faith from him. That's why I say, go to them that have and buy. Many things you are looking for is with men. Paul saw Jesus. Jesus referred Paul to Ananias. He said, go into the city. You will be told what you must do i saw a video on online i can't remember the exact time now and they wrote i don't need a mentor you know what is on the video how many of you saw it <laughs> the guy wanted to wed iron you know this kind of stand you have and then they are irons he had wedded everything it remained one spot so he wasn't looking well he now bent the iron, put his head inside, arranged it and wedded it. When he finished wedding, his head couldn't come out. They now wrote, I don't need a mentor. I can do it myself. That's where they end. You trap yourself. What you are looking for, somebody already is in possession of it. And when you find such, learn from them. Don't worship them, but learn from them. This is why we quote men. 
when we quote men we are trying to state the particular area of revelation and the life of God that we received from them it's not necessarily we are tapping into no no it has been abused but there are certain things that you learned oracles that you learn from people in first John chapter 1 from verse 1 and 2 it said that which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life he said the same we commit to you he said come have this fellowship he said truly our fellowship is with the father you want to grow you've got to follow them who through faith and patience obtained the promise in first corinthians 11 verse 1 paul said be ye followers of me even as i am the follower of christ finally you want to grow in maturity you have to ask god to help you every man standing is helped of god he said ask you will receive seek you will find knock the door will be open unto you why is this subject so important i told you number one to be approved of god you must be flawless in character to be approved of God, you must be mature. Christianity is not a religion where you are just exciting yourself. There is religion in Christianity, but Christianity is deeper than a religion. It is divinity expressed through humanity. And God is the only umpire that can tell you, well done. And so the reason you strive for maturity is because that's what gets God's attention. Number two, the reason you strive for maturity is because this is the safest ground upon which you, are, you can be assured of reward if you function by the will of God by the wisdom of God by the dictates of love subduing the flesh walking in spiritual understanding living above sin it's impossible for you not to be eternally rewarded and so it's a sensitive subject it's a vital subject and it's a serious subject my prayer for you today is this that the Holy Spirit himself will help you everyone standing is helped of God and the Bible said you should ask you will receive seek you will find knock and the door will be open unto you is a him that lacketh wisdom should ask of God that giveth liberally and upbraided not I pray for you today the Lord that giveth without favoritism the Lord that gives without partiality that same God will answer you and give to you much more than you have asked in the name of Jesus I decree concerning you today you will know the will of God for your life the days of being tossed to and fro is over receive the grace to find the will of God and to live it in the name of Jesus I decree concerning you you will function in spiritual wisdom and spiritual understanding walking in fruitfulness in the name of Jesus Christ I decree concerning you the power to rule the tongue and to subdue the flesh receive it now I pray for you today the grace and the ability to walk by faith and not by sight let it be released upon you manifoldly tonight in the name of Jesus I pray for you tonight the grace to take responsibility for yourself for others and for the kingdom receive it in the name of Jesus and finally I pray for you the ability to be accepted approved and fulfill the mandate of God for your life in the name of Jesus the Lord let it rest upon you now your walk with God will not be a waste your service in the kingdom will not be a waste. Your commitment to God will not be a waste. Peter came to him, he said, what is in this for us? And he said, no one that cometh to me will lack in this life or in the life to come. Receive the grace to be blessed in time and in eternity. The grace to be blessed in time and in eternity. You will not suffer in time because you are serving God. And you will not lose out in eternity while you yet serve God. In the name of Jesus Christ. Go 
in this thy might go in the strength of the spirit serving the lord and glorifying his name so let it be written and so let it be established in jesus precious name amen give the lord a big hand you may be seated please 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 take time and listen to this again some of the things i was saying were a bit fast when you listen again take notes some of you will appreciate it more after a few years and begin to pattern your life to grow in these dimensions you will not regret it in time and you will also not regret it in eternity thank you for coming do we have announcements we have something to say thank you for coming we'll see you again on sunday god bless you please rise up and share the grace in fellowship the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit rest and abide with you now and forever none of your steps shall slide every righteous thing you know has to do you are commanded to prosper in the name of jesus the blessings of god goes with you the presence of god rests upon you and you will be a man i hope you enjoyed this video and i believe that you were blessed if um, you were blessed by this video make sure that you click on the share button and share it with a friend and also make sure that you like the video so that youtube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message if you have any question please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you and also if you are watching this video and you don't know jesus christ as the lord and personal savior i want you to make that decision just contact us in the description call us and let us lead you to receive jesus christ as your lord and personal savior and lastly make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded, you can be notified. Thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section. Bye.